Why do certain chemical reactions occur and others don't? This is a primary question that chemists deal with. The elements can be combined to make a near infinite number of different substances. The key to making these substances is understanding what chemical reactions will occur and which ones won't. In this presentation, I will discuss the principles underlying whether or not a chemical reaction is spontaneous. What exactly does it mean for a process such as a chemical reaction to be spontaneous? A spontaneous process is one that occurs on its own, without a continuous external influence. Sometimes a little kick is needed to get it going, but once it is going, it will proceed on its own. A non-spontaneous process is one that does not proceed on its own. It requires a continuous external stimulus to keep it going. Note that the definition of a spontaneous process does not say anything about how fast a process will occur. A spontaneous process will occur, but it could happen within a fraction of a second or take thousands of years. A non-spontaneous process will not occur no matter how long you wait. The goal of this presentation is to understand the factors that make a reaction spontaneous or not. There are two primary factors that we will consider. The first is whether a reaction proceeds with an increase in disorder or the amount of chaos present, and this is captured in a quantity called entropy. The second is the extent to which the chemical reaction heats things up, and this is captured within the quantity called enthalpy. Putting entropy and enthalpy together will develop a criterion for spontaneity called the free energy. From everyday observations, we can gain some insight into what makes a process spontaneous. Many familiar spontaneous processes give off heat to their surroundings as they occur. Simple examples are burning a candle, or the gasoline in your engine, or the wood on a campfire. Transferring heat to the surroundings is one criterion for a spontaneous process. But not all spontaneous processes give off heat to their surroundings. Consider, for instance, the simple spreading of food coloring in a glass of water. The food coloring spreads out spontaneously when it is added to water. Instead of remaining a concentrated drop, it becomes more dilute, eventually leading to a uniformly colored liquid. The spreading out of the dye is said to occur with an increase in entropy, which is a measure of the disorder in the system. A second factor contributing to spontaneity is hence an increase in the entropy of the system. It is worth saying a word or two more about entropy. Although it does not rigorously apply to the assembly of Lego building bricks, they provide a helpful visual to further introduce entropy. The bricks in the picture on the left are more ordered than those on the right. They are more organized, less random. They are analogous to a lower state of entropy. The bricks on the right are less ordered, less organized, more random. They are analogous to a state of higher entropy. The phases of water provide a more chemical example. The water molecules in ice form a well-ordered crystal. The water molecules do shake around or vibrate a little about their positions, but they do not move freely throughout the crystal. The molecules in steam, on the other hand, are not well ordered. Although this is not conveyed by a static picture, they move around randomly through space. The water in ice is in a state of lower entropy than the water in steam. We have now seen the two factors that contribute to spontaneity. The transfer of energy is heat from the system to the surroundings, and an increase in the entropy of the system. If both of these occur, the process will be spontaneous. If neither occur, the process will not be spontaneous. If only one occurs, it will depend on the relative magnitude of the two effects to determine whether or not the process is spontaneous. Note the use of the words system and surroundings. If I carry out a reaction in a beaker, the beaker is the system, and everything around it is the surroundings. I emphasize this terminology to make a point needed for completeness. It is fine to think about spontaneity in terms of the two factors I have written here, 
but it is really only the entropy that matters. Point two talks about the entropy change in the system, for instance, the beaker I carry a chemical reaction out in. Point one talks about heat flow from the beaker to its surroundings. This heat acts to increase the entropy of the surroundings. The first criterion is related to the entropy change of the surroundings. Hence, the two together describe the entropy change of the entire universe, system plus surroundings. There is really only a single criterion for spontaneity, and that is that the entropy of the universe increases, and this is part of what is known as the second law of thermodynamics. Instead of talking about this single criterion, chemists find it helpful to split it into the two terms I have written. This enables us to focus more on what is occurring in the beaker, but it is really just a matter of bookkeeping. From this point forward, I will discuss spontaneity in terms of the two criteria here, without making explicit mention of the entropy change in the surroundings. You will find that you can readily use these concepts without worrying too much about this distinction. I will now expand on each factor contributing to spontaneity, in particular as applied to chemical reactions. A chemical reaction can either transfer energy to its surroundings, or it can receive energy from its surroundings. In the former, energy as heat is released to the surroundings, and the reaction is referred to as exothermic, think exit. An example would be the burning of natural gas, or methane, CH4. CH4 plus O2 goes to CO2, water, and heat. Note that I write heat as a product, indicating that it is released by the chemical reaction. A reaction that receives energy from its surroundings absorbs heat from its surroundings. This type of chemical reaction is termed endothermic. An example is dissolving ammonium chloride in water to make an aqueous solution of ammonium chloride. This reaction is used in some instant cold packs you may have used to reduce swelling after an injury. Here, heat is written on the reactant side, indicating that as the reaction proceeds, energy is taken in as heat from the surroundings. Why does a chemical reaction release or absorb heat? A major part of the answer is that bonds are made or broken. Energy is required to break bonds. And energy is released when bonds are made. If two atoms come together to make a bond, energy will be released as heat. If the bond between two atoms is broken, energy will be absorbed as heat from the surroundings. The net difference between the overall energy released when making bonds and the energy needed to break bonds largely determines whether overall the reaction releases or absorbs heat. The heat of a chemical reaction is called the enthalpy change of the reaction. The enthalpy is given the symbol H, and the Greek capital letter delta is used to indicate change. So the enthalpy change of the reaction is given the symbol delta H. The enthalpy change is the heat absorbed or released by the chemical reaction. If delta H is negative, the reaction is exothermic and heat is released to the surroundings. If delta H is positive, the reaction is endothermic and heat is absorbed from the surroundings. A couple of notes on delta H. First, the units of delta H are a unit of energy per mole. For instance, kilocalories per mole or kilojoule per mole. Second, the reverse of an exothermic reaction is an endothermic reaction, and vice versa. If I had a reaction A plus B goes to C with heat being a product, this would be exothermic. The reverse reaction would be C goes to A plus B with heat being a reactant. This would be endothermic. If the direction of the reaction changes, the sign on delta H changes. 
The enthalpy change is used to calculate the heat of a chemical reaction involving specific amounts of the reactants or products. Earlier we saw that burning methane is an exothermic reaction with a delta H of minus 213 kcals per mole. This can be represented by writing 213 kcal as a product of the reaction. What exactly does this mean? It means equivalently, 213 kilocalories of energy are released for every one mole of methane reacted. Or written as a ratio, 213 kcals per one mole of methane. Or it means that 213 kcals of energy are released for every two moles of O2 reacted. Or as a ratio, 213 kcals per two moles of O2. It also means that 213 kcals of energy are released for every one mole of CO2 produced, or 213 kcals per mole of CO2. Finally, it also means 213 kcals of energy are released for every two moles of H2O produced, or 213 kcal per two mole of H2O. The delta H per mole enables us to calculate how much heat is released by reacting a certain amount of reactant or informing a certain amount of product, or how much reactant is needed to generate a certain amount of energy as heat. For instance, how many grams of water are produced when enough methane is burned to release 631 kilocalories of energy? We know that 631 kilocalories, or kcals, are released, and we know delta H is minus 213 kcal per mole. We need to find grams of water, or H2O. The minus 213 kcal per mole is like a conversion factor relating moles and heat. To use it to solve this problem, we will need to convert between moles and grams because our final answer is in units of grams. The steps and conversion factors to be used are kcal to mole H2O and then mole H2O to grams H2O. To convert between kcals of H2O and moles of H2O, we use delta H. As the delta H is per mole of reaction as written, which has two moles of H2O, we write delta H as 213 kcal per two mole of H2O. Note that I account for the minus sign by simply saying heat is released. To get from moles of H2O to grams of H2O, we recognize that there are 18.02 grams of H2O per mole of H2O. This is just the molar mass. Writing all this out, we have 631 kcal times 2 moles of H2O per 213 kcals. Note that the reciprocal of the conversion factor written above is used so that the units of kcal will cancel. Then multiplying by the molar mass of 18.02 grams of H2O per mole of H2O, canceling the units of mole H2O, and plugging into a calculator yields 106.77 or 107 grams of H2O. Just like the enthalpy change of a chemical reaction, an entropy change for the reaction can also be defined. Entropy is given the symbol S and the entropy change delta S. If delta S is positive, the entropy of the system increases during the reaction. If delta S is negative, the entropy of the system decreases during the reaction. The unit of entropy is an energy unit per mole Kelvin such as calorie per mole Kelvin or joule per mole Kelvin. By recognizing a few factors that contribute to disorder, it is possible to predict whether the entropy change of a reaction will be positive or negative. On a scale of low entropy to high entropy, solids are lower entropy than liquids than gases. Fewer types and numbers of compounds is less entropy than more types and numbers of compounds.
Here's an example. Is the delta S for the following reaction positive or negative? The reaction of magnesium, a metal, with chlorine gas, a nonmetal, to form the ionic solid magnesium chloride. A solid and a gas are converted to a solid. As gases are higher entropy than solids, this is a decrease in entropy. There are two compounds in the reactants and only one in the products. The reduction in the number of compounds implies a reduction in the entropy. If we plot the entropy of the system as a function of the progress of the reaction, the reactants have higher entropy than the products for the reasons stated above. The entropy change is negative because the entropy decreases in going from the reactants to the products. Earlier, we wrote down two factors that promote spontaneity. The transfer of heat to the surroundings and an increase in the entropy of the system. We now understand that for a chemical reaction, these are measured by delta H and delta S. If delta H is negative and delta S is positive, the reaction will be spontaneous. If delta H is positive and delta S is negative, the reaction will not be spontaneous. If delta H and delta S are of the same sign, either both negative or both positive, whether or not the reaction is spontaneous will depend on which factor dominates. As we will now see, the question of which factor dominates can be answered by calculating what is called the free energy change for the reaction. The free energy is given the symbol G and the free energy change of a chemical reaction, delta G. Delta G is related to delta H and delta S by delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. It is important that T is the absolute temperature in Kelvin, which is always a positive number. The units of the free energy change delta G are a unit of energy per mole, for example, kcal per mole or joule per mole. By calculating delta G, we can tell if a reaction will be spontaneous or not. If delta G is less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous, a situation termed exergonic. If delta G is greater than zero, the reaction is not spontaneous, a situation called endergonic. For example, consider the following chemical reaction. Carbon plus water goes to carbon monoxide and hydrogen. For this reaction, delta H equals plus 31.3 kilocalories per mole, and delta S equals 32 calories per mole Kelvin. Is this reaction spontaneous at 25 degrees C? As delta H and delta S are of the same sign, it is not immediately obvious as to whether or not the reaction is spontaneous, so I proceed to calculate delta G. In doing so, one has to be careful to pay attention to units. First, we need the temperature in Kelvin. Converting 25 degrees C to Kelvin by adding 273.15 yields a temperature of 298.15 Kelvin. We then proceed to plug delta H and delta S into delta G. Delta G equals 31.3 kilocalories per mole minus 298.15 Kelvin times 32.0 calories per mole Kelvin. Note that the two terms have different units, one kcal, the other calories. In order to correct for this, we'll need to convert the calories into kcals. To do this, we multiply the second term by one kcal per thousand calories. We then plug into our calculator, and the result is 21.76 or 21.8 kcals per mole. As this is a positive number, the reaction is not spontaneous. To summarize, we have seen that a spontaneous process is one that occurs without an external influence. For example, the burning of wood to form carbon dioxide and water continues on its own. The reverse of a spontaneous process is non-spontaneous. For instance, the conversion of carbon dioxide and water back into wood 
the growing of a tree, requires an external source of energy, the sun. There are two factors important in promoting spontaneity. The first is the transfer of heat to the surroundings, as measured by the enthalpy change delta H. A negative delta H means that heat is released to the surroundings, and this promotes spontaneity. And two, an increase in the entropy of the system, as measured by the entropy change delta S. A positive delta S is an increase in the entropy of the system, which promotes spontaneity. The combined influence of delta H and delta S can be determined by calculating the free energy change delta G. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. If delta G is positive, the reaction is not spontaneous.